All right, my friends, you are in for a real big treat today. We are going to be talking all about the most radical car to have ever came off the GM production line, a car of international styling, intrigue, and unfortunately, a car that also had a bullseye on its back when it came to Ralph Nader. And if you can already guess by looking at what's right behind me, we are going to be talking all about the history and the demise of the Corvair. Let's do it. Now, the man that initiated the design and build of the Corvair was the king, Ed Cole. All right, now, Ed Cole is prolific in automotive history. He is the father of the Chevy small block V8. He also helped steer the Corvette from being its very meek first uh, generation, first few years with the blue flame inline six engine. He worked with Zora Arkus Duntov. It's always a mouthful, but you got to love Zora. Anyways, he worked with Zora, the grandfather of the, or the father of the Corvette, and the two together took the Corvette from being a very initially meek sports car to the mean machine we know today. Okay, so now you got a little bit of Ed Cole's background. All right, so it's 1956, and Ed Cole is the general manager of Chevy. And Chevy is nailing it. They are the lead in sales at GM, General Motors. All right, but Ed Cole's not quite satisfied. He sees that there is a crucial area in the market that's not being tapped on by Chevy. And you know what that market is? Well, it's the compact car market. Now you see, in America, there was only one automotive manufacturer that was actually tapping into the compact car market, and that was the AMC with the Rambler, right? This is not the first time that uh, American automotive manufacturers were kind of late to the game. But that's okay. Now, Ed Cole, like I said, he's no, he's no dummy. All right. He's seeing the Volkswagen Beetles, the Renaults, the Fiats flooding into there. And he sees that that is definitely a market that Chevy can tap. And you know what's kind of interesting really to think back on is at no point do I think that Ed Cole initially meant to make the Corvair such a innovative and groundbreaking vehicle. I mean, I think he was just like, let's get into this compact car market, wham, bam. Tell me your thoughts down below. Now, another thing that I'm supposed to remember to do before I get too far into these videos is to remind you that if you like classic car content, you like classic car history, I mean, you basically like anything that has everything to do with cars, like I do. Well, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the like button, and I would appreciate it. Now, naturally, we ought to take a little bit of a break from all the talky-talky and take a look around the vehicle. Let's do it. just not much I love more in this world. Actually, there's a lot of things that I love in this world, but I absolutely adore a retro interior. Look at that. This color, everything. Mm -hmm. Chef's kiss. Okay, back to what I was saying. All right. Chevy with Ed Cole at the helm decided to make an incredibly groundbreaking vehicle, all right? A car so unconventional that you would never actually, you would never see anything come out like it, come out of GM or Chevy again, all right? 
They decided to go with a just completely for the American styling standards of the time, something so bold. All right. And that wasn't just just not the styling was just the bold part. It was a air cooled rear mounted six cylinder engine. And the Americans of the time were not used to that. And you know what? Sometimes bold styling moves and designs pay off, okay? And it did. The Corvair captured Americans' attentions immediately. Now, the design was done by legendary Bill Mitchell. So just a little bit about the prolific Bill Mitchell, all right? Bill Mitchell is the gentleman that did the Tri-5 Bel Airs, okay? Yes. And he is the gentleman that did the styling for the second generation Corvette, all right? He did the C2 Corvette Stingray 1963 split window. Ah, yeah. Now, really what Bill Mitchell accomplished with the styling is kind of a little bit of a European essence, all right? And why that's relative and important kind of to discuss historically is this was the 50s, okay? And cars, we were having European imports flood our market. Why that was important for European automotive manufacturers is this is post-World War II. European governments were like export or die, all right? It was essential for these automotive manufacturers to survive, to get their cars into America. So that was a little bit of a digression, but... That's okay. And I will say this, Bill Mitchell did a lot more. I just don't want to keep all of your time. Now, like I said, this was so groundbreaking and such a different looking car for the period that literally Time Magazine for 1960 put Ed Cole and the Corvair on the cover of the magazine right here. Now, also something to note is Motor Trend made it the car of the year. They put the Corvair as the car of the year for 1960. Now, something that is important to point out is that the Corvair remains the only American-designed, mass-produced car that is air-cooled with a rear-mounted engine. Very groundbreaking in the American automotive world. Now, let's talk a little bit about the first-generation body styles. The Corvair was manufactured and marketed in a four-door sedan, two-door coupe, convertible, four-door station wagon, passenger van, commercial van, and pickup truck body. Now, the first generation was produced from 1960 to 1964. Now, with the second generation produced from 1965 to 1969, you would have the two-door coupe, your convertible, and a four-door. A total of 1.8 million Corvairs were made during the two generations. Now, some of you might be wondering, where did the name Corvair come from? <gasps> well, I'm going to tell you. The Corvair is simply a combination of the Corvette and the Bel Air. And now it's time for us to talk about what killed the Corvair, okay? Now, I'm going to go pretty hard on Ralph Nader in a bit, but it would be unfair for me not to include the fact that the Mustang did a lot of damage, all right? You see, the Mustang came around in 1964 and a half, and it caused a sensation. It sold an unbelievable number of units and just kind of dominated the market. And you know what I'm not going to do? Even though I almost did it, I'm not going to do it. Almost digressed and talked all about Lee Iacocca. But that's for another day. We're sticking to the Chevy Corvair. It's hard because I do love Lee Iacocca. Maybe we'll just do it. Nope. 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 No. Way to go me, because I can really talk about the first generation Mustang. I'll just show you mine, since we're, since we're right here. This is my baby, my 1965 Mustang Fastback. Bought that for myself for Valentine's Day. Way to go me. Anyways, back to what I was saying. Okay, now, 1964 and a half, the Mustang comes out, right? Well... Half a year later, what book, what famous book comes out in 1965? Well, it is Ralph Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed. And now with that book, Nader seriously goes after the Corvair, targeting its suspension, 
Now, in regards to the Corvair suspension, it was circulated that engineers had deliberately omitted a part of the suspension that was originally planned due to cost, and later years would feature the anti-sway bars. But with that, it's important to mention that in 1972, Texas A&M did a safety report on the Corvair, and their report showed that the 1960 to 1963 models of their Corvair showed no greater danger and and loss of control than other cars of the day. Now, why did Ralph Nader target the Corvair? I'm not entirely sure. He went so far as to during a congressional hearing, he called it the leading candidate for unsafest car title without any actual proof. Interesting thing to think about was, was some of this politically motivated? Were his own political aspirations playing a role in this? I'm not too sure what the deal was. I also feel like it's important to point out that when Ralph Nader wrote Unsafe at Any Speed, he had never had a driver's license. So just super strange. Now, another thing that's very interesting to note after dropping the bombshell that Ralph Nader never even had a driver's license when he wrote that book (sighs) blows my mind. Tell me, tell me what your opinion about that is. That's really interesting. Another thing that's very interesting is you had Mercedes Benz, Tatra, Volkswagen, and Porsche all using very similar swing axle design concepts and they didn't get any flack from Nader. So literally, Right after that book in 1965, sales dropped from 220,000 to half of that. And then the subsequent year was like 14,800. Total sabotage on the Corvair. And I want to go ahead and applause the balls on Chevy, okay? Because after the book, they were like, well, we're going to go ahead and do the second generation. Because if they didn't, then they were basically admitting guilt that the Corvair was somehow unsafe. So they were like, well, we might not make any money on it, but we're going to do it anyways. I find this super fascinating, and uh, I want to know what your opinion is too, all right? What was Ralph Nader after? Was he, did he have a genuine pursuit of uh, passenger safety? Or was this all about political aspirations? Or maybe a little bit of both. I mean, it's hard to say. It is strange that the Corvair was just so targeted as opposed to any other vehicles of the air. So let me know. Write down what you think below. All right, my friends. Well, I hope you enjoyed that nice little brief and informal dip into the Corvair's history. Let me know what you think. Was it the Mustang? Was it Nader? What really was the demise of the Corvair? And what a sharp ascension, uh, and it's being car of the year in 1960 with Motor Trend to being only only selling 14,800 units and um, the target of a book. So super interesting. Anyways. All right, guys, if classic car history is your cup of tea and you're not already following this channel, well then you might want to. All right. You might also be wondering, well, who is that weird little blonde girl that's running around talking about cars? Well, you're right. Car history is kind of in the family. I'm the daughter of a mechanic shop. We have our family business, Shook Enterprises, that has been working on classic cars, antique cars, all types of cars for over 40 years. And we got a lot of fun stuff that rolls through our doors and hopefully rolls back out of the doors. And uh, if that's your thing, well, then go ahead and press subscribe. Take care.